the position he had held since the 1940s. In tonight's programme, Stephen Oliver talks with him at his village home in the Yorkshire Wolds, and the programme includes excerpts from his choral works. It begins with Francis Jackson playing part of Edward Bastow's Prelude in C at the organ of York Minster. Sir Edward Bairstow's organ prelude in C, a piece of music that you'll be very familiar with, Francis, not only because I know that you use it in your own organ recitals, but also because Bairstow was the person who accepted you as a chorister at York Minster. Did you want to go to York Minster? Oh, very much, yes. Where I lived in Malton, that was the great Mecca, really, and the great Sir Edward Bairstow... Oh, he was Dr Bairstow then was the musician of, well, the whole universe, as far as I was concerned, certainly of uh, the locality. And I believe he used to be referred to sometimes as King of the North, <laughs> m musically. <laughs> and after your years as a chorister and your training as a musician, you succeeded best at the early age of 28. Was that a shock to you? Yes, it was. Yes, I, I never expected to have that great honour wished upon me. And uh, it resulted in uh, a certain sort of breakdown, which, uh, however, I, I recovered from and uh, gathered myself together and uh, enjoyed myself hugely for the next nearly 37 years. Was that breakdown because you felt that the mantle of the great Bairstow was too heavy to handle? Yes, yes. He was such a towering figure that uh, I thought that I didn't have it in me. I probably knew that I didn't have it in me, in fact. What made Bairstow's music great? Oh, I think the... Uh, short answer to that is one word, sincerity. He um, would never say or do anything which had not a deep meaning to it. He was a Yorkshireman from Huddersfield <laughs> and so he knew uh, what plain speaking was. And that comes into his music. There's every shade of meaning in his music, from the powerful, uh, the rumbustious, to the most soft, ethereal, and uh, some might say sentimental. But it's all his own particular character. He was your mentor? Yes, very much so. Let's turn away from Bairstow now and talk a bit more about you. In spite of that sense of uh, being unequal to the task, you 
were at York Minster for a considerable length of time, a lifetime of giving music there. Mm. Somebody's described you as being a visionary organist. Do you uh, know what they might have meant by that? Oh, good heavens, no. I, no idea at all. Uh, if they mean that um, I understand what music's about, I hope that they're right. I certainly do try to get below the surface of the music and uh, put into it something which you can't see probably at, at uh, the beginning and it very often can take you a long time before you do find out what it's all about. Sitting here in your music room is a quite remarkable experience. You have over there a baby grand piano. You have there an organ, and up there is the most enormous horn that I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> What's that? That is an EMG handmade gramophone, and it was purchased in 1937 by a friend of mine. And on the table here is Bairstow's biography that you haven't finished yet, but how long have you been working on it? Oh, for 20 years, I think, which is, I, I do regret very much, but there have been so many things getting in the way of it. However, it is uh, progressing slowly, and I'm always hoping to make a, a supreme effort <laughs> and finish it. Well, just looking around the room at the amount of work that you still seem to be doing, particularly in composition, the organ must be vital for you here. Yes, it's very useful. Where did it come it, from? It came from a mission church in Belper, where it was placed by the, um, the gentleman in the big house. It was made in 1795 by a Stephen White, who is not very well known, but uh, he certainly made a beautiful organ. It was altered about a century later and made into a two-manual. But I'm, I was very fortunate uh, to be able to pick it up, if that's the right word, uh, with its beautiful mahogany case and uh, gilded pipes and uh, exquisite tone. <laughs> I notice that uh, quite a number of your compositions have been dedicated to particular people. Uh, one, your benedicity, was to Milner White, the Dean of York Minster. What was yes. Milner White like? Because I always get the impression that he was a very complex character. You're, you're right, yes. He was certainly a mixture. He could be tyrannical, yet he was very soft-hearted. A great theologian, of course, and he ran the Minster to its great advantage, I think. And he loved the music and was uh, a great support to the choir. How did you come to be able to write the Benedicite and to dedicate it to him? <laughs> because he suggested it to me. He'd had an idea when he was at King's and uh, Harold Dark was the acting organist. He suggested to Harold Dark that he should write a benedicity with one side of the choir singing O ye seas and floods, bless ye the Lord, while the other side of the choir would simultaneously be singing praise him and magnify him forever in order to shorten that rather interminable canticle. <laughs> So he put the ball in my court and uh, I went away and uh, truncated it, but in a slightly different way. I couldn't see it working exactly as he'd said. I wrote that in two hours and uh, 
dedicated it to him. And what a glorious piece it is. ye works of the Lord, praise ye the Lord. The words of the Benedicite seem perfectly natural in a country garden as lovely as this, Francis. Do you compose music at the organ or in the garden? Both, actually. I have the organ there, but I usually start on the piano. I've rigged up a sort of desk over the keyboard so that I can play what I want and then write it down immediately. I know that's not to everybody's taste. Uh, Bach used to despise people who did it. <laughs> and r so did Reinberger, too. And then, if I'm stuck, I just go out into the garden and relax <laughs> and uh, probably pull up a weed or two. And it's surprising how that cracks the problem sometimes it, it it's a very capricious business of course composing and you never know what's going to happen do you get a sense sometimes that music is given to you rather than you just think it out oh yes oh rather yes um and i always like the pieces which i like to describe as falling onto the paper without any of my intervention at all. I'm just the agent. And does the garden give you some inspiration for that? I mean, it is a lovely garden. There's a wonderful scene over the uh, Yorkshire countryside, and it's really very colourful. Do you, do you put a lot into that? Yes, I, I do that. My wife, Priscilla, looks after the vegetables, and I do um, most of the rest of it. Does the countryside mean a lot to you? Oh, tremendous lot, yes. Especially around here. I was brought up in Malton, seven miles away, and often with my friends, I used to cycle out here, up the hills and down again. I do love the countryside, and it's uh, so much better than living in a town. 
The marvellous thing about the garden that you've created here is its colour. And I know that a particular composer, Ravel, is one of your great favourites. You would mm -hmm. describe Ravel as a very colourful composer. Is there a connection between those things? I think there must be. Yes, the, these uh, sensual things, using the word in its best sense, uh, appeal to one, as uh, do, of course, the uh, cerebral ones. And Bach, to me, is the apogee in that way. So we have two opposing poles. When you look at the way in which worship's conducted in a great cathedral like York Minster, that is really very sensual, isn't it? I mean, it's drama, and it comes yes. at you in terms of colour and movement and music. Yes. Was that an attraction for you? Oh, yes. Yes. I remember very early cottoning on to that as a chorister, the uh, ceremonial at the Eucharist was marvellous and on Easter day the golden uh, robes would be brought out three uh, celebrant and deacon and subdeacon all in these marvellous golden robes they, they were great they were a great event do you try and capture that in your music when you're composing music say for one of the great canticles like the Te Deum Yes, I hope that that would come out because there are the wonderful words on which to build and one hopes that uh, one can fit appropriate music to the words, um, music which probably is in some way original and uh, hasn't been written before by either oneself or anybody else. <laughs> How does the TDM begin? What were you trying to do with it? We praise the O oh God. Well, we do that in a very affirmative way, I think. Britain, in his one in C, begins uh, softly, but uh, that was probably trying a different approach, which Britain often seemed to do. But I took the more conventional approach and began uh, positively. Confident music accompanying the great affirmation of the tedium. We praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. Francis, your wife's a Quaker. Mm -hmm. We've come to this church in the middle of the village. It's actually a former Methodist chapel, but used today as the village church. Do you both come here? Yes. Priscilla goes to the meeting in Malton almost every Sunday. And uh, she comes here for even song, which we have um, once or twice a month here. I can't think of a greater contrast in church worship than the silence of a Quaker meeting and the grandeur of a cathedral service. How did you both cope with that <laughs> difference? 
it, it wasn't f uh, difficult because um, each of us was uh, sympathetic to the other side of it and they are opposite poles really at, at one one end you have all the magnificence the wonderful well the building to begin with the architecture the glass and uh, all the the best music that we can do and uh, on the other hand just complete silence it's often said in the world that we're shocked into silence we are reduced to silence i'm not sure about that i wonder sometimes if we don't aspire to silence if we don't achieve a quality of silence which is bordering on very close to to worship and awe and wonder and i wonder if music and silence are complementary in that sense i think that there are moments in life when one is lost for words and uh, the best thing is just to say nothing i think as it is of course in uh, other situations when uh, if you're taken by surprise the, the best thing is to uh, say nothing <laughs> nonetheless i mean silence is very important to some people as the the means by which they can pray and they find music a distraction in that sense yes yes i can understand that very much <laughs> From York Minster as a chorister in 1929 to master of the music at the age of 28 and retiring from that post some 10 years ago, today you're still, Francis, a prolific composer. You're still a recitalist all over the world. But on a Sunday, you're to be found here and playing this instrument, the harmonium. Yes. Now, <laughs> there can't be any greater contrast between playing the organ in... York Minster and coming here to play this harmonium. Why do you do it? Well, because I enjoy the service and we stick to the prayer book here, which I really enjoy. And um, of course, there is no comparison. Uh, there at the Minster, one enjoyed one of the finest organs in the world. And uh, here, there's none of that. You've got the very basics, no responsibilities. There's no, no possibility of landing on the tuba mirabilis when you <laughs> want a soft stop. <laughs> and uh, so in uh, that respect, it's very uh, relaxing and uh, a comfortable sort of situation. And I do enjoy it. I get the feeling that you are more at ease here than you would be in York Minster. I think inevitably so, because the responsibilities there are so great. For one thing, you don't know who <laughs> is there, who of human stuff is there listening and uh, wishing to uh, make us an assessment. Here, all you have is the faithful singing their hymns and uh, a psalm and the Meg and Nunk. And uh, there's very little possibility. I did play the wrong tune the other day and the, vic <laughs> the vicar stopped me and said, no, I think we'll have the <laughs> other one, uh, which I proceeded to play, of course. You began by saying when we were talking that when you took over from Bairstow at York Minster that you really felt the weight of responsibility, that the mantle of this great man 
had in some measure fallen on unworthy shoulders. Mm -hmm. And yet looking back on the years that you held that post, you've been showered with honours, with an OBE, with doctorates, uh, with even a strange thing called the Order of St. William of York. Oh, yes. What was that? I don't know that it's particularly strange, but it was one which I think Archbishop Blanche founded. He um, presents it to certain worthy people. And I think there are only, well, not half a dozen yet. But it, uh, it's a very nice thing to have, of course, and a recognition of what one did at the Minster. But with all those honours that have been showered upon you, you were still feeling that you were worried about who might be in the Minster to listen to you? I mean, you who have taught the Duchess of Kent to play the organ? I mean, Not, not <laughs> absolutely, no. <laughs> but in some measure. You still seem to have that uncertainty about your own measure of worth. Yes, isn't that natural, really, to be doubtful about one's uh, capacity to do anything at all? I mean, one tries one's best, and uh, whether that's good enough or not, it's for others to decide. That's a very spiritual thing to say, I think, is it? because you're, it is about trust at the end of the day, that you do your best, and after that it's in the hands of God. You can't do any more, can you, really? The picture sometimes that you portray of yourself, particularly when you took over from Besto, is somebody who remained fairly conventional about what was happening. And indeed, you referred to your TDM as being conventional in its opening. Mm -hmm. But you were not conventional when it came to writing the Sanctus, the holy, 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 which a lot of people have portrayed as a mystical, almost wistful, whispering beginning. But you begin strongly. Why is that? Well, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, I think they'd make more than a pianissimo <laughs> sound, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> so I pulled out the tuba and we got on with it from there. Dr Francis Jackson, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. The Sanctus from Francis Jackson's communion service in G, recorded in York Minster in 1982 to mark Dr. Jackson's retirement as Master of the Music. Stephen Oliver was talking with Francis Jackson at his home in Yorkshire. <laughs> 